All right. Praise the Lord. Welcome, everybody, to Open Arms Community Church. We're excited that you're here today, and I want to invite you to open up the program that you received as you came into the outline of today's discussion. Uh, we're starting a new series today called Supernatural 2, Experiencing Authentic Spirituality. In Supernatural 1, which we did last month, we talked about exposing the dark side of spirituality. We talked about the things that we shouldn't do, the things we shouldn't engage in. But what about what we should be doing. Like, when we look at what the Bible says about Christian faith, we find that it's a whole lot more than just going to church on a Sunday morning and, and going through the motions of some ritual or tradition. In fact, when I was growing up as a non-Christian, there was very little. In fact, there was nothing about the church people that I knew about their lives and their faith that attracted me and said, there is something awesome here and you should be a part of it. Most of them were people that, first of all, seemed, well, let's just say less than happy, okay? They, they didn't seem to have any real joy. And, um, and when they went to church, it seemed like it was more of a duty and an obligation than something they even wanted to do. And when they did go to church, it was, you know, it was the, it was a bunch of rituals. You would go in, you would sit down, you would, you know, sing a couple songs, you would listen to a speech, you would give some money into the plate, and then you would shake hands and adios for the week. And outside of the church building, well, we know people are people. And they would have their problems too, and oftentimes the things that, that they would do were not so different from me. I would say that it's fair to say that they were a bit more moral than I was in their decision making, but beyond that, not a lot of difference. And it wasn't until I had a personal encounter with God that it really took a hold of my life and set me on a completely different course. Now, People had been sharing all of the arguments with me. They'd been telling me all of the right things. So informationally speaking, I was equipped to know what the message of Jesus was. But, you know, there was really still nothing powerful about it. There was nothing that was attractive to me. And I didn't grow up a Christian, but I did grow up in a spiritual home. And it was also one that was quite, you know, self-centered. So, you know, I was still very much focused on me, what I was wanting to see happen in my life and stuff like that. So when I did encounter God, when God got a hold of me and made himself known to me, it totally changed me. And so because of that, by default, I understood that Christian faith was a spiritual thing. It wasn't just a philosophy or an idea or a theory or a theology. There was an experience with a very real God who's alive and well and active in our world today and wanting to be a part of our lives. And then, because I was new to this and God was so real to me, I did what he says we should do, and that is I started to read the Bible. And not, I didn't just read it, I devoured it. I read, I read, I read. I would read for hours and hours a day studying the scripture, and I couldn't believe what God said. And I'm reading through this book, and not only did I have an encounter with God, but then I start reading this, this manual, this book, this love letter that he left for us so that we could all go back and make sure we had the same message. And, and I'm reading through it, and I'm seeing people, everyday, ordinary people, some of them relatively good, and some of them shady and shifty, not so good. And I see God engaging them. I see God doing amazing things. I see God in the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon a man named Elijah, and he was now empowered to be able to outrun the, the king's horses. Wow, that's impressive. 
I see him raising dead people, causing blind eyes to see and lame people to be able to walk, multiplying food, calming storms, causing axe heads to float. One of my favorite stories is the story of a man named Philip who was following God's guidance in his life. And God would tell him to go somewhere and he would go. And he goes down to the middle of the desert. And I'm sure he's thinking, this is crazy. Why would God send me here in the middle of nowhere? And along comes a chariot with an Ethiopian in it. And the Ethiopian is reading a prophecy about the coming Messiah. And Philip engages the man in conversation. And the Ethiopian gives his life to Jesus. And so he gets out of the chariot. There was water there. Who knew in the desert? And so he baptizes this guy. And when the guy comes out of the water, it says right in front of his eyes, bam, just like that, Philip disappears. And he reappears in a town 20 miles away. Can you imagine window shopping that day? Bam, whoa! That would get your attention, right? Teleportation, I love it. I have a thing for you know, getting places fast, so it doesn't get any faster than that. And that would be so cool, but Jesus has not hooked me up with that one yet. But anyway, so I, I'm reading through and I'm seeing all of these experiences that people are having with God. And like, it's not just occasional, it's the norm. And then I'm looking at the lives of the church world and i'm going something's missing and then i i keep digging and i i find that not only are the all there's these examples but then there's all this instruction on how to be a spiritual person how god created us to engage him and to do things with him and i'm going yeah yeah i did not sign up to just be a club member and pay my dues. I didn't sign up to just follow through some ritualistic religious system and, and believe in some philosophy. No, God got a hold of me, and I want to keep a hold of him, okay? This thing was about engaging with God, and that's what we're going to see in a moment that Jesus taught. And so, Shame on us if we dumb it down and settle for something far less. And shame on us not just because we'll be robbing ourselves, but we're going to be robbing the world of the compelling reason to come to Christ, which is that God loves people. He created people for him, and he wants them. He wants to engage life with them, okay? So we're in this series, we're going to be talking about the present day ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit. We believe as Christians in one God composed of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll be honest, it's a little difficult for us to be able in our finite minds to wrap our head around this idea, this concept of a triune being. And the best and simplest illustration I can give you is to remember an egg. It is one egg composed of a yolk, a white, and a shell. Three distinct components, three distinct parts and functions, but still one egg. Now that's a, an oversimplification of a very complex uh, aspect regarding God Almighty, but nonetheless, that'll at least get us started in this train of thought. So we're going to be talking about the present day ministry of the Holy Spirit, these things that the Bible refers to called spiritual gifts, right? So we're going to be talking about those. What are they? How are we supposed to operate in them? All of that fun stuff. Because unfortunately, when people say that simple prayer, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I put you in charge. I want to follow Jesus. I want to escape hell and gain heaven. And they say amen to that. For some reason, they think that's the end. It's not the end of anything except the old life. It's actually the beginning of something new, something crazy amazing, something supernatural. A supernatural relationship and adventure with God. 
And as we dig into what Jesus says about this here in a moment, I do want you to take note that in every scripture that we read, what we're reading about, Jesus is applying to all of us as Christians, as believers, as followers of Jesus. What we're talking about in this series is not isolated to and limited to those people who serve in church leadership. Nor is it isolated just to those who are the super spiritual ones. You know, the zealous Christians, super Christians. I'm just an ordinary guy. I believe in Jesus. I, I love God. I want to live for the Lord. But every day I go to work, every day I come home, I mow my lawn, stuff like that. Watch football on Sunday. God wants to work through you. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. He wants us to experience him daily. And what does this look like? Because, you know, how does it work? What are we supposed to do? And it's not like we can just, you know, ask Jesus because he's not here. And I don't know about you, but when I became a Christian, I was a little bit ticked off about that one. I mean, really, Jesus? You could come down and hang with these 12 other guys and, 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 and 70 on top of that, and a few others that aren't listed and named, just numbered, and, and you could hang out and answer their questions. What about me? I mean, they were just fishermen and tax collectors and thieves. I qualified. Not so much as a tax collector, but hey. So, why not me? And you know, I crossed paths with something that really got me. Jesus said this in John 16. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. I argued that point. No, no, no. Nothing could be better than to have Jesus by my side. Right? To answer my questions. To tell me which choice to make. But see, that's the thing. We want God to become our dictator and then we get mad if he does dictate. Tell me, God, which way to go. Left. I don't want to go left. So, here's the thing. He said, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit there, the advocate, some of your translations may have comforter, counselor, helper there. He will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So regarding the importance and the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is for our good and benefit. And, and why would that be? Well, just completely on a very practical level, let's understand that Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus was God who took on the limitations of a physical body. So as God in the flesh and embracing the limitations that that brings, he could only be in one place at one time. Now, how many questions could he field at any given moment? One at a time. Now, in our world of seven plus billion people, that's a lot of questions. How long would it take for him to get to yours? But Jesus said, no, it's, it's for your good that I go away. Because I'm going to send you another advocate, another helper. And this Helper is not limited to a physical body. He's God without the body. He's everywhere at all times. We like to use the term omnipresent. But it just means he's everywhere all the time. And in his omnipresence, he is omniscient and omnipotent, which means he knows everything and can do anything. And that God is with you and he's with me, and he's with every other human being on the face of this planet all at the same time. And when I ask him a question, and you ask him a question, and all seven billion plus people ask him a question all at the same time, he doesn't go like the old pinball machines, tilt, 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 wait, I can't handle it all. No, he can engage every one of us as though it were just us, all at the same time. This is why it's imperative 
that Jesus go and send the Holy Spirit because we need the Holy Spirit. And it's to our benefit, our good, that he comes. Well, what is this Holy Spirit? You know, without a body, who or what is the Holy Spirit? Jesus tells us. Again, John chapter 14. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. Stop there for just one second because I've got to lay a little foundation here. Circle the word love. Oh, yeah. You know, many of us are wondering, you know, okay, Mike, I know these stories that you're talking about. I, I know. And I've even heard modern day or church history stories of, of God moving in other people's lives in the supernatural kind of way. Why not me? Well, let me ask you something. Do you understand that aside from the first key element to experiencing God, which we'll talk about in a moment, which is faith, the second key fundamental factor to experiencing the move of God through you is love. So many people have just relegated Christian faith to nothing more than a list of rules and do's and don'ts. And they think it's all about just, oh, I got to go to church on Sunday. Oh, I can't do that. Can't talk that way. Oh, I, I've got to go serve the poor. I've, I've got to say my prayers. I've got to read my Bible. It's the have to's and the don't do's. But wait a second. Jesus said, love. Love is this key ingredient that so many of us are missing. Well, how come I don't see God move and, and do miracles through me? Well, do you love people? You see, why would God do a miracle through you? If you don't care about people, then that means you're doing the miracle not for them, but for you. And he's not going to do that. It's about loving God and loving people. You know, do we love God? Do we pursue him above all other things in this world? Is he first in our life? Do we love people? Do we consider their needs and, 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 and their situations and circumstances as important as our own? Does it move us with compassion? So often the answer is no. And when we do obey God, is it a have to, twisting of the arm, or is it a want to? Do we come up with all the excuses and reasons that we can't obey God? Everybody else is doing it. I can't tithe. I need that money. Or, I, you know, I'm just not a good prayer. I just don't know how to pray. Read the Bible. I'm just not that big of a reader. Or do we say, He gave his all for me. I'm going to give my all for him. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what it costs. I want more of what he's offering. I want him. And it's not just something he's going to give you. It's someone he gives you himself. It's like when you fall in love and you're pursuing that person to be your lifelong mate. I mean, do you do that? half-heartedly hey, hey uh hey babe uh, i think you're hot and i think we'd make a good couple uh what do you say want to get hitched i mean i i don't care if you want me to dress differently don't don't expect that uh, i you know um i don't care if you like those romance comedies i'm not watching them <laughs> I, I don't care if you like flowers i'm never gonna buy those for you i, I i'm gonna do my own thing but I think you're hot. I like what you bring to the table. So what do you say? Ladies, what would you say? No. Right? If you love, love is the second fundamental key ingredient to seeing God move supernaturally. And we'll talk more later on that. But Jesus goes on and he says, And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another, circle the word another, advocate. Your translation may say helper, counselor, comforter. To help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. 
The world cannot accept him, circle the word him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you, underline the phrase with you, and will be in you, underline the phrase in you. So according to Jesus, in what we have read in the last two portions of Scripture, we see that the Holy Spirit, he is a person, equal in every way, in power, in authority, and deity, with God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit is not less God. He's all God, okay? He is equal with the Father and with the Son. But their roles and their functions are different, okay? Just like when you look at that egg, the shell is the egg. It's as much egg as the white and the yolk. It just performs a different role and function for the egg, right? And in the same way, we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, in reference to the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I'm going to send you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I don't want you to feel abandoned and alone. I want you to know I'm going to send you another advocate or helper or counselor, depending on the translation you read. The word another there is a very specific Greek word. You see, there's a generic word in the Greek language for another which would be like me saying, hey, I've got a tablet here in my hand. Would you hand me another tablet? Now, if I use a, the generic Greek word for another, you might hand me, while this is an iPad mini, you might hand me uh, an, an Android operating uh, tablet. You may hand me a Samsung tablet. You may hand me some other uh, a Windows PC tablet. Or you might hand me a full-sized iPod, I mean iPad. And guess what? Using the generic word for tablet, I mean for another, you would be answering my request. But that's not this word. This word is a very specific Greek word for another, and it means one of the exact same kind. So if I say, hey, please hand me another iPad, another tablet, what I mean is, another tablet exactly like this. So even if you handed me an iPad, if it's not an iPad mini, then you're not answering my request properly. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you another advocate, another helper that's exactly like me. Jesus only everywhere, with everyone, all at the same time. Not only that, but we also notice something else. Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as a person. Note the pronoun him, indicating that the Holy Spirit is a person and not a force or power. See, growing up as a non-Christian, but in a spiritual home, when Star Wars came out, being a little sci-fi geek that I was, I was like totally into that. The idea of the force, yeah, baby, give me the power. I'll just wield at my every whim. I'll just control things, make things move. But of course I didn't. But then, you know, in fact, I get a little bit jealous of today's, uh, you know, advancements. The, the toys are just so much better. And, and my kids, man, they're so much more creative than I was. I didn't ever think of this, but man, we watch Star Wars and they walk up and, and the doors on the store go, you know, they open up. So my kids will walk up and they just know right where that line is and they'll go, mm. and it's like the force. I never thought of that stuff, but I wish I had. But the fact is, is that the Holy Spirit is not a force or an energy or just a mere power that we wield as we wish and control it. No, not at all. The Holy Spirit is a person that you and I learn to cooperate with. And when we cooperate with him, amazing things happen. The Holy Spirit is also our advocate. Now, this more recent translation, the word advocate, uh, we're not necessarily used to hearing that word. Um, some other translations use the word helper, counselor, comforter. But here's what I want you to know is that this word advocate comes from the Greek word parakletos. And it literally means one who is called alongside to help. 
Has anybody ever seen the logo of the Wounded Warrior Project? I love that, that project. I love that cause. And, and so uh, we were at, uh, I think it was Dick's or Gander Mountain one time, and they had a Wounded Warrior Project t-shirt. And so we bought that for my wife who will then fight with my daughter over who's going to wear it. But, um, you know, on it, it had the cool logo, which is a soldier picking up another soldier and carrying them off the battlefield. That actually is the very word picture that this Greek word means. It means one who is called alongside to another to help. And the word picture is of a wounded soldier on the battlefield and another soldier coming in and picking up that guy who cannot help himself and doing for him what he cannot do for himself and carrying him to safety into something better than what he could do on his own. That's the word picture, and that's the role of the Holy Spirit to come alongside. Now, you'll notice in your outlines, this Greek word, parakletos, is translated seven different ways. Counselor, comforter, helper, strengthener, advocate, intercessor, and standby. And the question is, which one's correct? And the answer all of them. It means all of that. So don't zero in on just one of those roles. Don't just limit the role of the Holy Spirit to being a helper or, or just an advocate, one who, who stands in the gap and intercedes on behalf of another. No, 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 no. Go and learn the definitions of all seven of those words and you'll have a much fuller picture of what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do in your life. So he's this parakletos, that is just like Jesus. And he's in your life and my life. And that's the next thing. Notice that Jesus said in this scripture that he is both with and in you. Now, that's a part of the scripture that most people read it and they just gloss right over. They keep on reading and don't take the time to think, what did Jesus just say? Because if you really think about what Jesus just said, it's kind of redundant. It's worse than redundant because he says the Holy Spirit, he will be with you and he will be in you. Well, you know, if you just said he'd be in you, it's an understood thing, Jesus, that he's with you. I mean, in you, you can't like, excuse me, can you just move, leave? I'm going to go here and I want you to stay there. It doesn't work that way. He's with you everywhere you go, right? If he's in you. But Jesus specifically in this order said he is both with you and in you. These are two distinct geographical locations in your life that the Holy Spirit is in to execute two very different roles in your life. And that's what we're going to unpack very quickly. So first of all, in regard to him being in you, let's explain that one first very quickly. The Holy Spirit is God's spirit who lives in every follower of Jesus. When you give your life to Jesus and you say, Jesus, take charge of my life. You're the Lord. You're the king of the universe. And I'm not going to play that role anymore. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to accept the directions you give me. When you say this, and you truly believe that, the Bible says that, notice 1 Corinthians 3, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? The Holy Spirit immediately enters into you and bam, makes you a new person on the inside that's going to work its way out. Now that's a whole other topic of discussion, but he enters in. In fact, the big question then is, well, what's he doing there? I mean, just sitting there, drinking a coffee, waiting for what? What's he do? The answer is found in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, and you, were all, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So when you hear the message of Jesus and you respond to that by faith and say, yes, I believe, I want to follow Jesus. Notice the next part. When you believed... You were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So when I make that claim and I say, yes, I believe Jesus be the king of my life. According to this, God goes, bam. Holy Spirit is now in us, and why is he there? He's a deposit. He is marking us. God is saying, this one, he's mine. And when I come back to take possession of the earth 
and all the rest of creation, guess what? This one's a part of my team, a part of my family, a part of my kingdom. They belong to me. Isn't that awesome? We are God's possession. You say, well, I I don't want to be just a possession. Hey, husbands, are our wives our possession? Are we okay with sharing them with someone else? No. And if you said yes, you're sick and we need to talk afterward. (laughs) Okay? No. No, they belong to us, don't they? Wives, is your husband your possession? Yeah. Not to be shared. We belong to him. He loves us with a crazy love. And he wants us for himself. So the Holy Spirit enters into us, first of all, to to say this one belongs to me. But, But that's it? He just sits there? No, he performs a job. What's he do? Notice, the Holy Spirit is with us to teach, guide, and show us things to come. Check this out, John 14. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. How cool is that? You got questions? He's got answers. Notice this. And he'll bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. This is why you and I need to get the word of God deep in our hearts. You know, when I was going to Bible school, I was working full time. I was going to uh, I was going to school full time. And so in a word, I was tired. I mean, I was exhausted. But every day. I would come home between school and leaving for work and I would get my one year Bible out. Every year I would read through a different translation of the Bible. And it had daily readings and I would crack open that day's reading and I would start to read it and I would underline and I'd, you know, go through it. But I was so tired I started to fall asleep. You could see where my pen would go bloop. So I, I'm sitting in the chair trying to do these devotions and every day and I'm going, oh gosh, I can't do that. So I get up and I start walking around. And I'm, re- I'm reading out loud to myself, talking so I don't fall asleep. And I'm reading my, my uh, Bible reading for the day. And, and, and there were days where I'd just go, God, I'm just not getting anything out of this. I, I'm just not feeling it. But you said this promise that you'll bring to my remembrance what you taught. So I'm going to be faithful to continue to read this, continue to plant the seed in my heart and in my mind. Even though I didn't feel like I was getting anything out of that, I was going to stay disciplined and do it anyway so that when the need arose for myself or for somebody else, the Holy Spirit would have something to work with and say, hey, Mike, remember this? Right? Make sense? John 16, Jesus continues on to teach that the role of the Holy Spirit in us, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Why is it that Christians are so much like bumper cars when it comes to life, trying to figure out, which way do I go, George? Which way do I go? Boom, boom, boom. I mean, we just bop around, floundering. Why? When the Holy Spirit will guide us. Is that not cool? Your own GPS to lead you through life. The problem is, is we've got, have you ever driven on a trip and you're enjoying the view and talking to somebody and you got the radio blasting all at the same time and then the GPS is saying, turn right, turn right. Hey, stupid, turn right! But you don't hear it because you've got all these other voices going on in your life and it's so loud and so busy and so distracting you miss the instruction. That's kind of what happens when the Holy Spirit tries to guide us. We're just listening to all these other voices. We have our life so busied up with all these other things that we're not hearing the instruction. It's not that God's not faithful. It's that we're not listening. Notice the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but notice he will speak. Is God talking to you? Do we even know what that looks like? 
But he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you, I love this one, he will tell you about the future. Is that not awesome? God will speak to us about the future. I could tell you story after story, you know, like just coming to open arms. Did, how did we know that this was where God was going to plant us, my family and I? Well, God gave me a dream about some of the things we'd be contending with here. God spoke to my daughter, who was six years old at the time, and said, Daddy, does Jesus put things in your heart? Yeah, that's one of the ways he talks to us. Okay, why? He just told me that you're going to be pastoring that church. He'll show us. He'll talk to us about the future. Are we listening? Are we walking in the holy power of the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit in us. He does all these things. But we also said that Jesus said he'll be with us. Well, what is that about? What's this being with us do? Notice in your outlines that the Holy Spirit equips us and empowers us to be a witness and do the works of Jesus. A different function, a different role. This is no longer inward and about you. This is outward and about the world around you. He's going to equip you and empower you to do the works of Jesus. In Acts chapter 1-8, Jesus said this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon, circle the word upon, upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now let me ask you something. Whether your translation says upon or your translation says on, is on or upon the same as in? Help me out here. huh? No. Two different things. So, let me give you a quick example. Water is one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit in the Bible, so is fire. Interesting that they're opposites, but anyways. So the Holy Spirit, we learn, is going to go in us, right? Guaranteeing that we belong to Jesus, and he's going to perform all of these jobs in our life of guiding us and teaching us and reminding us, all that stuff, right? It's all about me. But he also wants to do something else that doesn't have to do with me. It has to do with the people around me and that is it says he wants to come upon now in is not on or upon he wants to come upon us you'll notice i've given you a scripture reference of luke chapter 24 jesus actually described the holy spirit coming upon you in a different way he said you will be clothed with power from on high so clothed right got my little koozie it comes on or upon the cup get in there little cup it clothes with power from on high let me give you just one more quick example of this. Eric, can you come help me? So Eric's coming up. He's going to give me a, a quick little bit of help here. So I've got this water in the cup. Come here, Eric. Eric, what are you doing? Get up here. Uh, I don't know. Now you're making me more nervous. Take a drink. So, so the Holy Spirit's going to enter Eric. Drink. In, right? Is that on? No. This is on. <laughs> Okay, that is on. I love you. Thank you. That is on. There's a difference between on and in. And we, we get the Holy Spirit being in us, and we like that part. But it becomes a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit unnerving when we start to talk about the Holy Spirit being on or upon us because now we're getting really crazy. I mean, it's already crazy that God's going to speak to us, guide us, and show us things to come. But it's even crazier now because now he's empowering us to do the works of Jesus, to be his witness. Notice what it said in John chapter 14. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am I'm going to be with the Father. I want you to circle the word anyone, circle the word believes, and underline the phrase, same works. Friends, first and foremost, I want you to see that Jesus did not isolate doing the works of Jesus to just church leaders or spiritual zealots. 
It's for anyone who believes. So the first and fundamental factor, key factor in you experiencing the supernatural with God is do you believe? Faith. And you can't escape it. Do you trust? Are you confident that God is who he said he is and that he will do what he said he'll do? Do we believe that? And then, of course, I already started the conversation that love is the second key ingredient, that we have to be moved by love and compassion towards others, toward God and for God and toward others and for others. And now we come to the uncomfortable discussion of what are the works of Jesus? Because he said, you're going to do the same things I've been doing. Well, what did Jesus do? Multiplied food, calmed storms, healed sick people, cast demons out of them, caused dead people to rise. I mean, hello, all kinds of wild and crazy stuff. And he said, by the way, if you believe in me, you're going to do the same works I've been doing. In fact, even greater works than these. Now, that one really makes us uncomfortable. So, you know, the, the more conservative guy goes, well, you know, Jesus, he really didn't mean greater as in quality. He meant greater as in quantity because he was only ministering for three and a half years and, and we're here for, you know, 80 years. And so he meant we'll just do many more than he was able to do because of his limited time frame. And the other guys who are more spiritual and robust, no, Jesus meant greater in quality. He caused blind people to see. We're going to make people with no eyes see. And you think I'm joking, but you wait till part three of this where you get to see that very thing. I honestly don't care. I am just wanting us to get to level one. Let's just do the same things Jesus did. If we get there, I'll be happy because we're not. Too many of us are wanting to argue these points and we're not doing either one of them. Let's just focus on following Jesus and stepping up to what he's called us to be and to do. So in your outlines, it is because of the Holy Spirit and with every, it is because of the Holy Spirit in and with every believer that we have the power and authority to do the works of Jesus. And I refer you to Mark 16 and Matthew 10 where you can see Jesus telling everyday people, hey, I'm commanding you. I'm giving you my name. I'm giving you my spirit. Go out and continue the mission that I started and the power and the authority of God Almighty. And by the way, I'm going to give you a little extra zip, a little pep in your step, a little something extra called spiritual gifts. Check this out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So over the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about these manifestations of the spirit that God has given his people. They're referred to in Scripture as spiritual gifts. And we are taught that they were given to us to grow the church and to strengthen or mature the church, to become more like Jesus and all that God has created us to be. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time in this series addressing. What are these spiritual gifts and how do we operate in them? What did God mean? But to help kind of give you an idea of, of what this looks like to kind of build some anticipation of God working in you and through you. I want to share with you a video that gives an example of someone. This guy's name is Todd White. Todd White loves Jesus. He is radical. I mean, radical in the sense of he's not afraid of people. He's very courageous and bold in his faith. And he's willing to do what most people aren't. I mean, we have a hard time praying for somebody in the church. This guy goes outside the church onto the streets and grabs complete strangers that are unbelievers and ministers to them in the power of the Spirit of God. So I want you to check out this video, and then we'll close things off. 
Is there anything physically that gives any of either of you any trouble at all? Like your back, no, no, your no, knees, no. anything at all, man? I've, I've always had my thumb really weird, dude. Is it weird right yeah, now? Yeah, like, yeah, always. When I do it like this. Because I, I used to ride a skateboard. Oh, dude, watch this. This would be so good. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Father, I command you to be made whole. Every tendon right now, every cartilage. In Jesus' name, right now. Loosen in Jesus' name. Do it, moving around. Are you kidding me, dude? No, dude. Dude. No. Man. Yeah. Can you heal my heart? Yeah, let's do it. We're just going to pray, right, for peace. What's your name? My name is Gerald. Gerald. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name, God, for Gerald, right now. In Jesus' name, I thank you for amazing peace. I'll break that spirit of suicide off of you, in Jesus' name. I command all depression to get out. Come, Holy Spirit, right now. You're going to feel his presence, man, because he's, he's, already, he's already there. You can already feel it. Lord, I thank you. I ask you for more right now. More, God. More. That's so good. Yeah, yeah that's so good. Dude. It makes you want to almost like laugh and cry at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Dude, that's so good. Oh, my God. Look up on the screens, man. You've got the kingdom of the world right here on these screens. And right across the street from this stuff, Jesus said, I love you. In the middle of nowhere, man. In the middle of this town, it is full of drugs and full of wrong things. Dude, it doesn't and even it, matter. It, that's why this feels so weird, because at least I thought it was going to be in the church. So, like, a girl, like, broke your heart so bad. So, like, it puts you to a point where if God's presence is so good and so thick, then how could you let somebody get to your heart so bad when Jesus wants to be number one in your heart? For sure, for sure, for sure. Come on, man, let's do it. All right. What's your name? Noel. Noel. Father, I thank you for Noel in Jesus' name, God. <laughs> I just thank you for joy right now. Come, Holy Spirit. God, I ask you for more right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Depression, I curse you and command you, let him go. Father, I thank you for more. Let your presence come more, Lord. In Jesus' name, God, thank you. More. That's so good, man. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do, man? What's what's the kind of stuff that you do? I skate, snowboard, surf, do you? rock climb, bike. I see art, man. I see yeah. a real creativity. Like you have a real artistic thing inside of you. Like you draw. I like do. You have a, a real sketching ability. A real like, a real actually. You could actually paint, man. You actually pick up painting. It's something that God's placed in you. It's an amazing thing. All right, dude. God is gonna do some amazing stuff with you. It's really good, Thank man. You. Come on, man. Yeah, it's I good. Love, I love this sketch. I'm going into architecture next year. Are you really? My passion. An architectural engineer. Yeah. So, what's our response? What's our reaction to that? Some people are excited, going, no way, that's awesome. I want to be a part of that. And others are going, I need skepticism, doubt creep in. Is that real? Is that staged? I mean, where are the fireworks, right? I mean, okay, his thumb was healed, but where's the boom? Is there a boom? Is there fireworks? Is there twinkling? Is that what makes it miraculous? Or does God just show up and touch people in ways that mean something to them and help them, whether it's healing a thumb or a broken heart? I love knowing that he's so not into it. Yeah, man. Yeah, sure. And then God starts reading his mail. What are you into? Skating, rock climbing, all of these outdoor sports he names. And then the Spirit of God starts to prompt Todd to address drawing. And that's what he's going to go to school for. What if God started speaking through us? What if God started healing people through us? What if God started showing up and touching people's lives in tangible and meaningful ways? Through you, through me. Do you think that would make a difference? Do you think that would get people's attention and be attractive and give a compelling reason why Jesus, why Christian faith? 
and not something else or nothing else? I think so. You know, it's hard when we, the believers, are trying to give a compelling reason for others to believe and we ourselves don't. God wants to do a work in our lives. He wants us to experience him regularly and be a part of this amazing mission and adventure that he started. Will we? As we close, some of us today, something is stirring inside. We're not followers of Jesus. We're not believers. But something is saying yes, and that something is what we've been talking about today, the Holy Spirit. He's stirring in our hearts saying, now's the time. This is what it's all about. It's not about going to church and just believing the right things and going through the motions of ritual. It's about following Jesus. It's about coming alive for the very first time and and living life like it was meant to be lived. And that will look different from one person to the next because we all are different. And if that's you, you can't explain it. You don't have all the answers. You just know Jesus is calling and you want to respond. If that's you, we're going to say a simple prayer for you to say yes to Jesus. But for some of us in this room, we're Christians. We're believers. We just struggle believing. We're Christians and we want the things of God. We got one foot in the kingdom of God, but we still have another foot in the kingdom of this world. We want Jesus and we want to follow him. We want this amazing experience with God, but we want fame, fortune, good feelings, big screen TVs, Jeeps, boats, motorcycles. Yes, Lord, yes. But listen. Are we a God chaser or a world chaser? Because you can't chase both. You can have God and enjoy the other stuff that comes along, but you can't have all the other stuff and have the Lord. See, either Jesus is going to rule your life or the stuff will. And there is no in between. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You'll either love one and hate the other or serve the one and despise the other. So who's in charge of your life today? And if it's not Jesus, but you want it to be, if you are a Christian who's been kind of loosely holding on to Jesus and drifting in the other direction, and you feel compelled to recommit your life to Christ, I want to invite you to say a prayer of commitment with us today. So let's close our eyes. Pray this prayer with the rest of our church family. Say, Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for pursuing me. And today I just want to confess that I've done my own thing. I've done wrong in word and deed. And I've hurt others. I've hurt myself. And I've hurt you. Please forgive me. Today I declare Jesus my king and my master, the one in charge of my life. Now take charge. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me to do your works. I want to faithfully follow Jesus. Do life your way and get your results. Now help me to never stray and never fall away, but to grow up day by day to be a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you-